everyone. My name is Tania Besky. I'm the Director of Operations for the Council to Advance Hunting and the Shooting Sports. And we're here to host yet another webinar on building your R3 team. And I am so excited about our session today. Uh, we've welcomed folks together from state and NGO partners who've created shared positions to continue to break down silos and continue this conversation about ways that we can enhance your R3 toolkit. Um, as you know, we've been recording these sessions and posting them bi-weekly on the R3 community. And we're going to be doing that from now through early fall. And we've talked to folks from licensing and communications and GIS and outreach, and these conversations will continue. Um, so today I would just like to welcome our team of folks to have this conversation. Um, we've got Dennis Fox and Bill Fisher from Michigan, Bob Knack and John Motoviloff from Wisconsin, Doug Burt from Arizona, Hunter Nikolai from Nebraska, and Lance Cherry and myself. So I'd like to go around the circle real quick and just ask you all to introduce yourselves, talk a little bit about your position and your relationship with R3 in that position. Um, so Lance, if you'd like, as one of my co-hosts, to please just introduce yourself first and then we'll go around the horn. You bet, thank you, Tanaya. I'm Lance Cherry and I am now the Communications and Marketing Manager for the Council to Advance Hunting and Shooting Sports. Um, been involved with R3 since I would say the inception, um, long before it was R3. And so real happy to be here today and, and join everyone for this discussion. Glad to have you Lance, thanks so much for joining us. Uh, Doug, if you could go next. Yeah, I'm Doug Burt with the Arizona Game and Fish Department. I am the program manager or the R3 program manager. Our branch is the R3 branch and we house a number of different programs. Uh, uh, some shooting sport activities, National Archery in the Schools, SETP, which I believe a lot of people have. And then we have our hunter recruitment program. And we have now we have our angling recruitment program under our uh, uh, privy, as well as hunter ed. And then our partnership outreach program, which we refer to the hunting angling heritage work group. Uh, and then I administer a grant program specifically for uh, recruitment, retention, reactivation. Um, and I've been doing this since 2011. Uh, I've been with the department since 2007, so um, yeah. Awesome, thanks for the overview. I'm so glad to have you, Doug. Good to see you. Bill, could you go next, please? Yeah, glad to be here. Uh, Bill Fisher from uh, Pheasants Forever. I'm the outreach coordinator in the uh, state of Michigan, and I've been here since uh, 2016, and uh, my job is to uh, recruit new hunters and reactivate uh, through learn to hunt events and shooting sports. And um, we do a BB gun trailer event that we have a lot of fun with. So glad to be here. Thank you. Glad to have you, Bill. I'm glad you'll be representing those shared positions between states and organizations on behalf of Pheasants Forever and Michigan. So thank you so much for joining us today. Dennis, do you mind going next? I'm Dennis Fox with the Michigan Department of Natural Resources. <clears throat> I'm the R3 coordinator for uh, Michigan DNR, and part of my responsibilities are to oversee the federal grant that we use to fund the shared positions, but also the cooperative agreements that are the internal documents that we use to kind of like provide the details as to what each organization is going to do um, as part of the agreement. And then I also sit in on uh, internal recreation marketing team that we use to um, develop tools to uh, recruit, retain, and reactivate hunters, anglers, and people that we're trying to get to do outdoor stuff. So, Excellent. Thank you. We're going to be dig digging in on your expertise specifically when we talk about some of the logistics of running positions like these shared ones. So thank you so much for being here. Glad to have you. Uh, Hunter, do you mind going next? Absolutely. Thank you, Tanaya. My name is Hunter Nikolai. I'm the Nebraska Hunting and Shooting R3 Coordinator. Uh, with the National Wild Turkey Federation in a shared position with the Nebraska Game and Parks. And I've been in this role for about a year, um, so still obviously learning new things all the time, but see my position working very closely with the Nebraska Game and Parks, probably close to 90% of what I do is with the R3 team and staff at the Nebraska Game and Parks Commission, um, kind of serving as a liaison between marketing and permits and our program leadership and, and coordinating kind of all the research uh, information that needs to, to get to those folks on the R3 side of things, um, and then coordinating workshops and learn to hunt type events. 
um, on that side. And then on the NWTF side, I coordinate and lead. We have four what are called Save the Hunt coordinators here in Nebraska that put on education and outreach events and workshops and involved with providing them a lot of resources and information um, to do what they do on the ground. Excellent. Thank you so much, Hunter. I'm glad to have you. I know Hunter and I have also been working together on TAG or the assessment group. Um, and so you've been influential in some of the National Hunting and Shooting Sports Action Plan review. Um, so thank you so much for joining us. Uh, Bob, coming over to you next. Sure. Hi, everyone. My name is Bob Knack. I work for the Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources. And my official title, title is our R3 team supervisor. Um, and so I've been, I'm relatively new to my position. I was hired in October of 2021, so still don't have a full year under my belt, and I'm learning, uh, learning a lot and learning from the great staff that I supervise. Um, speaking of our team, I guess that the areas that, um, that staff work on, uh, certainly Angler R3 uh, programs um, and uh, uh, promotion, uh, hunting R3 and in our learn to hunt programs. We have staff dedicated in those areas. Uh, shooting ranges, we have a number of public shooting ranges across the state that um, that I'm getting familiar with and, and have staff working in those areas. Uh, hunter education is another one that uh, obviously very closely re related to R3. And so I do supervise some staff in our, in our hunter ed program as well. And then the last one I would mention um, is our archery education program. And I, I've heard Doug and others mention NASP and S3DA and, and uh, explore bow hunting. And there's a number of programs out there that we have staff focused on as well. So I kind of kind of oversee each of those areas. Fantastic, Bob, thanks so much for joining us. And we're glad to have you in the community. It's, a, it's been great to see you at our free symposium. And, and I know you've got a rock star team working with you. So thank you so much for joining us today. And John, last but not least, back to you. Yeah, absolutely. Good, good segue there with Bob. Um, so I am a partner R3 coordinator um, with the Wisconsin DNR, and I work for the National Wild Turkey Federation, similar capacity to Hunter. Um, so kind of work hand in glove with the department, uh, and then also work with our chapters here in the state and our Save the Hunt coordinator, who's turned out to be a very, very active uh, volunteer and has a whole little cell going um, with fishing and hunting opportunities um, out of his his retired uh, farm. So um, yes, it's uh, it's it's great work, and I suppose I've been doing R three um, unofficially since probably about um, thirty or forty years. I've been taking people out fishing and hunting since as long as I've been doing either one. Awesome, John. Thanks so much for joining us. Glad to have your expertise on the call. You bet. All right, well, now that we have a kind of a general sense, we've got three folks that are on here that are in shared positions and three folks that are managing state R3 programs to varying degrees, um, and then council staff as well. So I'm going to start off with a few questions focused specifically on the state perspective about these shared positions. And so again, we're focusing our conversation on how these positions help us to break down silos and how they enhance our R3 toolkits by having these positions. And so if I could open the conversation up to our state, specifically the state folks, and ask you, uh, how were these NGO positions started in your state? Um, was it easy? Was it difficult? You know, what was the main driving factor there? I can start off from Michigan. Um, you know, we had, we, I was looking back through my files, and we started these discussions way back in 2012, and it really coincided with you know, the, the, the start of the increase of the Pittman-Robertson fund, funding that's available to the states. And, you know, the, the NGOs were doing a lot of the same work that DNR staff was doing. Um, and then we, we were approached by Pheasants Forever first about creating a shared position. And it's something that we as an agency had done on the habitat side with uh, the partners, but also through the university, uh, Michigan State University, where we where we could access the funds, we would provide funding for the position, then the position would be embedded within a different organization and allowed us to basically spread the funds further and it allowed us to get more done with the funds. So it was, a, it was just two other people, one from Pheasants Forever, another person from 
the agency and we kind of had, we met and we sketched out what we wanted to do with the position. And then after we kind of, the three of us came to an agreement, we started working it up the chains within our organizations. Um, once we got the general concept support, then we put pen to paper, came up with uh, a cooperative agreement and that was inked by the director of our agency and the CEO of Pheasants Forever. And after we did that, then we went and started looking for funds, you know, creating the grant um, that we used to fund the positions. And I worked closely with Fabian Romero on the federal staff, and he was great. I mean, there was a lot of questions because this was relatively new. You know, the grant was new, the intent and what we wanted to do was relatively new and the whole, what are you gonna do with our three was new. And so he was absolutely fantastic to work with. He gave us a lot of guidance. He gave us a lot of good recommendations on how to draft a grant and what would be allowed. Um, and so we got that in place. And then after, you know, we got that, those agreements in place and the grant in place with presence forever, we started working with the National Wild Turkey Federation. Um, and we basically followed the same, same uh, blueprint where we, you know, got agreement conceptually on what we wanted the position to do, you know, got, got the support from the leadership of our organizations, did the cooperative agreement, and then, you know, ad added them into the grant. Um, part of, you know, the other aspect of the grant that we have is we created a separate smaller amount of money that's used for equipment and supplies. And so it's not just NWTF and Pheasants Forever that have access to the federal funds. We also have funds that are available for other groups like the Michigan United Conservation Club, Safari Club International, some of their local chapters. Um, and we do a cost match where it's 75% of federal funds, but then the partner organizations come bring to the table 25% match. So it's worked really well for us. Um, we've had the agreements around for a long time and we're doing a lot of great work with it. So really appreciate the, the support of the organizations and the support of the, you know, the leadership within our agency. That's fantastic. And that leadership support is such a pivotal part of moving forward with big initiatives like this. So thanks for highlighting that and um, the importance of some of that work. Thank you. Uh, Doug, would you like to build off of that concept a little bit? Yeah, I, I think the biggest thing was, you know, it, it, it came out of the national plan um, to have a dedicated individual for R3. And um, Bob will be able to pick up on this. Is we have a lot of staff that do a lot of things, but it's not specifically always just R3, like a national archery and a schools coordinator is primarily dedicated to that, that activity or a, a sport fish education program. So those programs are designed to do what they do, but they weren't rooted in R3. They didn't develop in R3 as far as uh, developing a hunter or angler. They were engagement within the, the organization. So I think uh, our director being involved with the council prescribing to the national plan, seeing I think it was the top six items to have a dedicated staff and then in the state of Arizona, we're in a big hiring freeze. We still are in a hiring freeze. We have a limited government uh, policy. We have a headcount for our organization. So a contract position, a shared position, didn't fall under that. It took us some wiggle room to get through the state on uh, identifying that those were not considered state employee positions. And it was a service that we were buying just like anything else. And once we got that green light, that opened a door to be able to add staff not staff, but to add capacity um, through through bringing in a shared position. And it's been instrumental in what we do. I mean, it's uh, uh, they didn't have an assignment already. They didn't have program uh, allocated to what they're doing. Uh, Bob and I can probably go back and forth on this is, you know, even as you mold and rearrange your branches to be an R3 modeled branch, there's, we have legacy programs been around for 15, 20 years that still have to follow the, the, the drum that they're after, um, and then mold them into R3. But you don't get a full one-time person to do, I want you to do recruitment, retention, reactivation. And to me, that's specific events, that's registration, that's evaluation, right? Developing mentors and that sort of thing. And we just didn't have the capacity to do that. So 
working with the T Turkey Federation, they they were all in. I, I don't know what what their main driving force was, but I think uh, half of us have Turkey Federations and the other half has PF here. Um, I think there's eight Turkey Federation uh, shared positions and uh, they've been really, real simple to, eat, uh, to work with. Uh, I think we're harder to get our agreement through our channels than it is to put in front of Turkey Federation, get a signature. Um, funding was really not that big of an issue. Like Dennis mentioned, uh, we did have some sig significant PR funded. That's how this position's funded is just regular section four PR funding. Um, yeah, they've been instrumental. I'll tell you what, uh, not having them, it was scary at first, right? It's like, what's this person going to do? Are they going to do my stuff or do we have to create new stuff? It, it was really, it was an uncertainty. Um, we're in our second uh, employee right now, uh, sorry, our second contract person. And every time they're establishing something new that I was unable to do, I didn't have the time to do, put things in place that are systematic, that will their legacy type uh, improvements to our R3 model. Uh, and, and I think that's been core to have an R3 coordinator. And I think Hunter reflected on that a little bit, how he integrates with, with the agency. Our person is basically with me 100% of the time. They do whatever we're looking to do. And it, it's fantastic, the really easy working relationship. I'd like to dig in on that a little bit later in yeah. our conversation about their responsibilities for sure. But I love that you shared about the idea that we're in hiring freezes or that FTEs are really hard to come by. And so adding staff positions for our three teams can be really challenging. And these NGO shared positions can help be a, a healing salve uh, when we're all lacking in capacity in some ways. So thanks for pointing to that. Yeah, if you have a state wildlife agency, I mean, the position is already predetermined. It has an index number, it has a job a position description. So if you're looking to do something outside of that, like establish a new position, it's very difficult, at least in, in our state wildlife agency to go, we would like to establish a brand new position or like, mm -hmm. really? <laughs> Why and where's the money? It, it's really hard to do that. And these are three-year agreements. So um, it, it's a little easier to, to have that conversation and not be committing a full budget of, you know, uh, employment, uh, retirement, uh, healthcare mm -hmm. benefits, that, that gets really scary at that state level when you're in a hiring freeze. So I'll pause, yeah. sorry. No, Doug, I think that's great information. And I think as folks are watching this webinar, they're going to be thinking about the, the added value and expanding capacity. So I think that's a great thing to point to. Uh, Bob, I'm sure you've got some things that you can add to that conversation. And I know your team has, has benefited in similar ways. Yeah, no, thanks. And I'm, I'm glad Dennis and Doug went ahead of me. Uh, I don't have a, a ton of history to, to share. As I mentioned, I'm relatively new, uh, so I don't have the history and the origins of the positions in Wisconsin per se. However, um, I would recognize that and agree with Doug that, you know, the challenges with taking on new responsibilities and new positions uh, within state government, are, are, it's just very difficult to come by uh, in today's day and age. And so, if we want to do these this work and, and people think it's important enough to do it, these partnership agreements are 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 great for that. Um, in that you know we have the organizations that are saying this is important. We're willing to you know contribute and participate. Um, you know on on our end another benefit maybe it's a selfish uh, benefit for me but and I know you're going to talk about supervision as well uh, Tanaya but. Um, you know, when, when you add a state employee, whether it's a permanent position or even a seasonal employee, there's supervision responsibility, there's expenses, there's a lot of things that come with even just keeping the lights on in an office for that employee. Um, and so one of the, the nice things about, about these positions is that, um, you know, the position number itself is with the, the organization and some of that supervision responsibility is, is there as well. Um, and so, you know, when you're looking at number of reports for a supervisor, at least for the state agency, um, that, you know, that pressure and that responsibility is a little bit reduced when you're working with a partner. So just a couple thoughts there on additional benefits um, that, uh, that, that I've realized. Uh, I guess maybe the other thing too, I, I would mention at least here in Wisconsin, um, and John's been through this longer than I have, but um, our process is, is uh, 
tr we try to make it as simple as possible to to you know establish these positions and, and develop the agreements. Um, I know we're kind of nearing the end of our three year agreements and we're going to be looking uh, to the future here and and um, you know there are other organizations that are catching on to this and are interested in as well. So I, I see it as something that um, that you know at least here in Wisconsin, I think is a bright future. That's awesome. Thanks for that insight. And I think that's something that the people that are listening to this webinar can keep a pulse on and, and say, you know, it's a com common complaint or conversation that I that I hear and that I personally experienced when I was an archery coordinator in South Dakota, that capacity is lacking. We've got the opportunity to engage in multi-state grants. We've got the opportunity to engage in national work groups that are going to drive the future of R3. We all have a day job, a full-time day job. And so taking a look at how we expand our toolkits and how we expand our capacity is, is certainly an area of focus. And I, I love the comments that Doug is leaving in the comment box about how these positions um, and, and how they run, it all adds up, whether it's HR, reviews, evaluations, all of those things that you would have to do with a full-time employee that perhaps is somewhat alleviated by partnering with these positions, all that adds up. And so these are really kind of efficient and effective uses of time and resources. Um, so thank you again. And, and I appreciate what you had to add to that conversation, Bob. Um, what I'd like to, to do next is lean over to our NGO partners and talk a little bit about the logistics of these positions. So like, what's it like having multiple leadership? Um, who do you take your work direction from? Who does work evaluations? Um, you know, what's it, uh, what's it like specifically to, um, have some of the freedoms that you have that maybe your state partners don't have. Talk to me a little bit about those logistics on your end. And uh, Bill, maybe perhaps you can kick us off. Uh, it's, uh, you know, went very well with, with our groups. We've, you know, developed the plans and uh, Dennis and I and the other R3 group in the state of Michigan, we get together bi-weekly to discuss what what we're all doing as far as programs and what we need to focus on and go through that part of it. Um, as far as uh, PF does all of my evaluations and uh, takes care of all that on that side. And obviously they're gonna talk to Dennis to see how I'm doing in the state and how things are going, but it's a, a great partnership and uh, we work well together and uh, you know I have the freedom to if I have something new or if I want to do it I just you know I come to my supervisor and Dennis and we discuss it and we you know say okay let's lead it this way and it's uh it seemed to work it's been working very well um and uh, you know I get the freedom to kind of do some of the things that I just want to take off and do. I don't have to specifically be, for a word, say maybe micromanaged or mm -hmm. I have a little bit more flexibility, I think, than maybe some state employees would have as far as taking on those new things and looking at different ideas as far as how to bring into the, the R3 community. Yeah, I think, Bill, along those lines, you know, you're linked into this national network of professionals, right? Thousands Forever is across the whole country. And so you've got this opportunity to bring in that fresh perspective on the ground um, in, in a new and, and fresh way that perhaps, like you mentioned, state agencies may not have the freedom to be able to implement immediately or as quickly. Um, so I, I, I appreciate you bringing that up. Yeah, so it, uh, yeah, like you said, we have other coordinators in other states and you know so we all get together monthly and discuss different things and what's going on in all of our different states so you know I may be able to grab something that we're trying in another state to bring it to Michigan so it's a it's a great networking thing in that perspective as far as because all of our agreements are different every Outreach coordinator and PF has a different agreement with the state that they're in. So it's, a, it's just kind of neat to see the different agreements and how things work throughout the country with the, the different uh, agencies. Excellent. Oh, thanks for sharing that. And John, if you don't mind, I'd love to hear kind of your perspective about 
um, that kind of dual leadership and some of the freedoms that you might have in your position and how work direction works in your in your role? Yeah, totally. Absolutely, uh, Tanaya. And it's funny that the, the word I heard Bill say freedom um, and that kind of nimbleness that we have as non-state employees really allows us to innovate. And I give you an example. I mean, I have fairly general objectives on my contract, you know, to sort of reach out to new hunters to run a certain number of programs. But I had this idea of using some grant funds um, from um, at NWTF to do a video series. And so I uh, came up with the video series, interviewed some novice hunters and anglers, and basically put together with some, with a freelance camera crew, um, uh, you know, hunting uh, squirrel, grouse, turkey, and trout videos. And this is just another way that I was able to innovate and deliver the the R three objectives. And so I think this would have been harder to do under you know the kind of tighter parameters of a state contract. So I'm able to take on things like this in addition to my regular job duties. And it's very fun and very challenging. And um, uh, yeah, I think it's kind of the best of both worlds. You know, I've got structure from DNR and structure from NWTF and some sideboards, but really every day is new and um, get to do great things for R3. Yeah, well, I personally benefit from that tremendously working on the MAFWA implementation, or sorry, the MAFWA um, small game diversity and inclusion toolkit with you um, on the steering committee was tremendous and having your expertise there was a lot of fun and the capacity that you added. So I have, I, I've definitely seen what you're, what you're talking about and appreciate that. Yeah, no, it's, it's good. A few, you know. Oh, just went on mute, John. Few of those long weekends there, but uh, you know, you're getting home at Sunday night late and you're working Monday morning, but um, it all comes out in the wash and the freedom is more than worth those occasional long nights. Yeah, thank you for adding to that. I, uh, I know Hunter has quite a bit of experience with some of the things that you were just talking about. So Hunter, I'd love to hear what you have to add. Yeah, I think John and Bill kind of hit the nail on the head with the freedom and ability to innovate and take some risks that you may not be able to take when you're working for a state agency. I know I, I worked for a state ag agency prior to this position and some of the freedoms are immediate and, and like um, Bob and Doug and, and them mentioned those position descriptions for those shared positions that I'm in with NWTF that PF is in, they're, they're directly written you know, for what they want that person to do. And that allows, you know, if a state agency writes a position, it, it's in a bureau, it's in a department, it's limited in scope, but our positions, you know, my position description, breadth across programs, marketing permits, and just opens up a lot of opportunities that, you know, a, a state agency position might not have. Day-to-day um, -day and kind of management style, like having dual leadership, it's, it's been, it's gone very well. I'm you know, I work out of the Nebraska Game and Parks office. My day-to-day -day manager is the great Jeff Rawlinson, who many of you know. And then on the NWTF side of things, Mandy Harling, the director of hunting heritage programs. Yep, you got it, Tanaya. He's right there. He's always with us. Um, she's my, my go-to for permissions and uh, budget and things like that. But it's a very easy process if I want to, uh, you know, pursue something I see on the national level or, or pursue something another state is doing it. Um, you know, that's that's very easy for me to do versus trying to go through some of the red tape permissions approval processes that agencies have. So it's been, it's been great and, uh, you know, just the ability to pursue some of those national and regional work groups and projects too, great because you're gathering all that knowledge, insight, um, staying up to date with what's going on and, and not trying to reinvent the wheel and bring that back to Nebraska. Oh, that's awesome. And again, that perspective of freedom, nimble, nimbleness, innovation uh, from your positions, and then that national network, you know, like, we've got our state agency network of our three practitioners, and then there's this additional layer of networks that comes from our NGO partners that they also have. And if you can get those to jive with one another, you're, you're expanding the expertise available to any one state or organization exponentially. And I really appreciate that perspective as well. Um, so just quick, John and Hunter, and the NWTF also provides your evaluation performance reporting kind of stuff. Just, just making sure I've got that consistently down in my notes. Yeah. Oh, so, you know, basically, yeah, we've got some sideboards with, with um, I'm probably Hunter's got a similar contract to mine. And generally speaking, it's just, you know, 
delivering a certain number of R3 programs, um, helping out with NWTF duties. Um, but it's it's a really, it's kind of a nice blend of flexibility and structure. So to say some fairly basic objectives, but a lot of room within those objectives to innovate. Mm -hmm. And so you're really built into the state team, I mean, is what I'm hearing, that you've got some of the structure built in with your, your NGO partner, but you're really a part of and, and functioning as part of that state team. Yeah, very much, very much. Cool. Yeah, so we developed develop a work plan for the year on the NWTF side of things, but that plan, at least how, how we did in Nebraska was, you know, I, I created my work plan based on my, um, my job description and objectives there and worked with my uh, boss on in Nebraska and then brought that to the NWTF to, you know, then, then it, you know, it was developed within the state and went to the NWTF for kind of approval or just to make sure everything's on the up and up. So it really does start within the state and kind of go up from there. Cool. So I think that's just a phenomenal overview here. We've talked about how states have, have worked towards getting these positions created and what the benefits have been to add that capacity to states and, and kind of Dennis gave us an overview of how he worked through the logistics of creating those position just, um, agreements. Um, and then now we've heard from the NGO side about what are the logistics of these positions look like and some of the freedoms that they have. I think next I'd like to move into this conversation around um, benefits and challenges. So, you know, as folks are looking at these positions, we, you know, we've already hit a couple of major highlights of some of the benefits of them, but what are some of the challenges that you face um, in these roles from any perspective, and this is wide open to anybody on the call. Um, and what have you been able to get done together that wouldn't have happened otherwise? You know, what what are those things? What are the challenges and what are the real breakthroughs? It, I can I could give a couple challenges. And this is, you know, something that from the, the state perspective side, you know, when people are looking at if they want to do these agreements, um, probably the biggest challenge we faced early on was working with our procurement staff mm. because we were purchasing a service. And <clears throat> when you're purchasing a service in state government, <laughs> I don't know if the other states are like Michigan, but it's, it's, it's difficult. And so getting them to understand what we were trying to do with these positions and making sure that we were doing everything within the allowed laws of purchasing and spending money in the state government, that was an initial challenge. Once we got past that, then it made things a lot easier because there was all these questions of, do we have to put this out for bid? You know, is this a sole source contract? Can we even do this? Is this allowed? Um, so that was one of the, the, the challenges that we faced early on. And, you know, you know, sitting down with those procurement staff and explaining what we were trying to do, you know, and getting them to understand it really helped smooth the process greatly in Michigan and getting these, you know, agreements in place and, you know, getting these contracts signed or the cooperative agreements signed and stuff. So. Just quick before we move on, Dennis, that's some great points to point out. Again, to people that are looking at this, what are the answers to those questions you just hit on? You know, do you have to go out for bid? You know, can you walk through a couple of those things really quickly? Um, we did not. We did not have to go out for a bid the, um, because we were able to justify that this was very specialized services that we were, you know, um, trying to um, get done with the state. The other thing that really helped was that this was all federal funding and there were not state funds involved with this. And so that kind of opened up the, the arena a lot easier because, you know, all of the state um, state legislation that creates all the restricted funds that state agencies have, especially on like the natural resources side, weren't impacted by this. This was all federal funds. So as long as we were following the federal guidelines, and that's where those conversations with uh, Fabian came into play, was making sure that we were doing things correctly. It was an easier sell on the, the side with the procurement staff. So love that and those are going to be tools what you just offered that people at home can listen to and say all right i'm going to get fabian or my regional rep for the feds on the on the call so that i can work through the logistics of grant funding and what's eligible and what's not and i'm going to get my procurement people together and talk through the logistics of spending federal money on a service not hiring a staff member that's Absolutely. great and doug i see that you'd like to add to that conversation go ahead please yeah uh, like dennis was saying is ours is not service it is a project 
right? We have an MOU with National Wild Turkey Federation and we are aligned through our mission and our shared interest. So this is a, pro it's federally funded. It's a project to do recruitment, retention, reactivation versus, you know, a contractor that has a, a contract in place with the state of Arizona doing service acts or whatever. I think that's kind of what cleared the road for us. So we didn't run into any of that. Um, and, and, and if you don't mind to move away from the, 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 <laughs> the procurement side, one of the downsides for us is they're only three year agreement. So you always end up with a gap. So I'm gotten greedy, right? I don't like this position being vacant and you don't have succinct, right? You have three years, depending on if they go the full term or if they get a different position, then you got the hiring process, very similar like anywhere else. Um, so we've been lucky we've gotten two great uh, contractors, but when the gap is there, you, you notice it. Uh, and, and to state folks, this is what, one thing I'd recommend is, so I don't have my R3 co coordinator run events or like real R3 events. I have them build systematic policy or um, build things that I can pick up and move forward that I couldn't do before. So if they're doing events, right? You have an individual doing 50 events a year, right? And then all of a sudden there's a vacancy. What happens to the legacy of those events, right? It's just like having a regular vacancy. So, um, so you get a lot of um, capacity, but then when there's a vacancy, you lose capacity, you lose uh, integration with your customer journey and your customer experience. So my boss and I, we've, we've, our focus is putting this person to develop systems, methodologies, and, and, and uh, means to improve R3 so when they're gone, that these systems stay in place and they're still effective. Like building Zoom, right? We couldn't do this. I needed technology so I can do that. I could never build it on my own. Once it's built, right, I can run Zoom on my own. So versus I don't want this person hosting 50 webinars a year because when they're gone, I, I don't have that capacity and my customer experience goes down. So th those are my barriers was, you know, losing the position and waiting to hire it again. Um, and then making sure that you're using them for um, something that that you can handle that that loss and that that you know the ebb and flow of that position filling and unfilling. That's a really interesting philosophy, and I appreciate you sharing that, Doug. Just this idea of in using your shared positions to institutionalize R three and expand your system as opposed to implement R three. Correct. Uh, that's a really interesting philosophy. And I know that that's going to vary by state depending on what the identified need is. I, I understand that, but yep. it's an interesting perspective. Yeah, we're partnership based. So I want this person making as many friends as possible, bringing them underneath the tent that we have, selling them on our three need, the purpose, the value and why it's important and getting them engaged. And then I can keep that right. I can keep that ball rolling. But it's similar if you're not doing programs, if you're doing other type of marketing projects and stuff like that, have them do all that research so you know how to do that marketing all the time or, or, or you know, dig into the, your license data. The things that, you know, Dennis and, and Bob and I, you know, our heads are spinning. We don't have time. We want to, but we don't have time to do that. Awesome insight. Thank you for sharing that. That kind of, I think we've got multiple different ways to view these positions and what they're capable of. And I appreciate that diverse perspective. Um, Bob? Talk to me a little bit about your perspective here. What are some of the challenges you've taken a look at and maybe other thoughts you have in response to Dennis and Doug? Yeah, thanks, Tanaya. And appreciate Dennis's uh, input there on the procurement end of things. Um, we, we went through that prior to me last summer, and I think we're going to be going through some of those discussions moving forward here. So I took, I took good notes, and you might be hearing from me as well. Um, but another challenge that came to mind for me, and, and again, I think maybe we're working through a little bit of this as well, um, is when you know the state's policies and guidelines on a particular thing might be different from the organization. And so the maybe the obvious example that I'll use is um, COVID and, and COVID precautions. And, um, our agency, you know, provided direction on our in-person events, um, you know, that we're we're going to discontinue those. And as things were uh, lightening up, you know, when can we go back to in-person? When our masks required, and and all of that stuff. And um, I think that you know it was challenging in that you know the state had 
had, uh, you know, maybe a tighter perspective on some of that stuff than maybe the organization did. And so, you know, John and, and Marty Moses, our Pheasants Forever uh, coordinator, are sitting there, well, you know, Turkey Federation's not as strict on this stuff as the state agency. So can we do programs and just not use your logo? <laughs> and, you know, and those are, those are good questions. Um, and, you know, we, we talked through that. I think we navigated it, it, it just fine, but yeah, it's just, uh, that was one thing that I remember, you know, just kind of working through with John and, and Marty and others and probably thought it was worth mentioning here as well. Yeah, COVID certainly brought on a, a whole new list of adaptive challenges for all of us. And, and that's definitely something to point to that, you know, COVID may not be the only space in which um, policies may influence the way that you work together. Uh, so that's something great to be to be conscious of. Um, Hunter or Bill or John, is there some, are there challenges from your perspective that you'd like to share and, and talk about a little bit? Yeah, I can jump in and go first here. I see kind of two major challenges that stick out to me from being in this position for about a year now. One is as simple as kind of the logistical aspect of having a different email being on a different um, system than your state agencies that you're working in integrated day-to-day -day with. So, you know, for me to look at my colleague's calendar, I have to send out a doodle poll or, you know, so there's little simple things like that that go across the board, just, you know, being housed under a different organization than them. Um, and you find ways to overcome those challenges pretty quickly, uh, but that's something that just stood out to me right away. And the other one is just building relationships and trusts within um, the agency that you don't necessarily work with on a day-to-day -day basis, but that, you know, our team is an integrated team. I'm integrated with them. They understand that, but getting our uh, communications and permits and administration staff to understand my position and my role, you know, it's taken, taken time, taken me um, communicating, uh, you know, providing successes and working with them and, and really for them to see the value in my position. I think that's something that is going to continue to take time to do for, for folks across the agency to see and understand that, you know, I, most of my duties are working for the state agency and, and integrated directly with that. Um, but they see my email address is different. They see, you know, my benefits coming from the NWTF. So there's some challenges there, but it's, it's all about building relationships, building trust, um, and, and that we've been able to overcome some of that. So That's a huge piece. And for the folks that are at home listening to this conversation, we're bringing in somebody who is embedded in our team and our culture and our structure and how we work. And as our three coordinators who do work for the state agency, it would be important to help facilitate that relationship building and, and to help make sure that, that you're enhancing the relationships that are happening outside your immediate working team. Um, so Hunter, thank you for sharing that. I know it's kind of a vulnerable conversation to have, and I, I think it's an important consideration as we bring in these new staff members, um, especially if we want them to be able to perform. That's great. John? Yeah, no, I, I was going to say one one challenge too, and this kind of goes back to this notion of freedom that we brought up earlier, is that, you know, you are there and you don't necessarily have the more or less, you know, eight to five, you know, state culture. So you want to do programming all the time. And it's really easy to almost overdo it and overextend yourself when you see an opportunity, you want to take it. And so it's a question of, um, you know, keeping a balance between, you know, um, offering programming and also, you know, making sure that you don't do it every weekend. Cause let's face it, at the end of the day, we're all hunters and anglers and we like to get out ourselves. Um, and so trying to, trying to get that balance of picking the right programs, not, you know, and then also trying to just, you know, make sure that you've got a little bit of time for your, for your own stuff. Cause, cause freedom cuts both ways. <laughs> That's a great perspective, and I think folks that end up in these positions oftentimes end up being um, very high-performing folks that love what we do, and I think being aware of those boundaries is, is something to be considered of. Thank you for sharing that. There, there's something to be said about this, this standalone position, if I can, just for a second, is you're bringing in these fresh eyes, right? These, these are not you don't go to school for this position. There's there's areas of, of interest and stuff, but there's not an R3 degree, right? And we've been fortunate to have two folks that if, if you're willing to let someone poke holes in what you do, right? I've been doing this for 10 years. I know the way I want it. I, I know the systematic approach that I want to do things. And there's pros and cons to that as being a statey, right? 
But, you know, our, our first coordinator, you know, we asked him straight out, what's messed up? You know, what, what don't you like? What, 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 what doesn't align with what, now that you've been doing this for six months and you know, the general principles, you've been to a symposium, you know what the, the national philosophy is, you know, where, where, you know, where's our sacred cows, you know, and, and show us how to knock them down. Some things we can't, right? Some, some legacy things we can't move, but there's ways to do things and, and, and slowly steer a boat. So it, if you're a state person, you're looking to do this, um, you've heard a couple of people have said they're fully integrated with the agency. That's number one. I, 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 I won't budge on that. If you have an R3 person, they need to be in your office. They need to be doing what you do day to day and be integrated with what you're doing. And then be willing to, to let these young professionals tell you, listen, this isn't a very cool way you do this. You know, you look like, a, right? I got, cold, I got called not cool by my first R3 coordinator. <laughs> Different generation, different philosophy, but he was right. And we molded and we did some different things. And I knew what I wanted to do, but I wasn't doing it. I was doing it like a state person, like Dennis and I were just talking about, right? We're going through procurement. Do I have to go out to bid? Instead of just going, hey, you know, it'd be really fun. It would be like a trivia pint night. And we'd just meet people and talk to people about doing so. I go, oh, yeah, that sounds great. We can't do that. He says, well, I can. So, so use that flexibility, but, but be willing to, here's the biggest thing in R3 to me, do not have pride in ownership or you will die. <laughs> you will work every weekend. Like John talked about, you'll never be satisfied and you'll never get to the end, you know, be, be willing to take some challenges and, and hiring someone that's outside of your purview. Um, it does that. So, so embrace that pain, um, not that pain, embrace that difference, you know? Yeah, I, I steal a hunter right now. I want in his head. I want to know everything that he doesn't like. You know, I want him to take Nebraska, right? He's on Nebraska right now. We do things completely different than Nebraska. And I think having Hunter for six months to a year would be so valuable. But so before this turns into a joint custody situation where yeah. Hunter does a couple of job offers. <laughs> I'll talk, I'll have to talk to Aaron. And Jeff, you're a hot commodity hunter. You hear that? <laughs> it, it's an eye out. I'll, I'll add to that just real quick. And as another challenge that I'm experiencing here, um, and Doug touched on it, is, is hiring staff. Um, we're working to hire some support staff um, for our R3 coordinators. <clears throat> and I'm telling you, we're, we're, I'm, unless I'm advertising in the wrong places, we're just not seeing um, real high quality applications come through in this area, which you know is concerning to me who, who grew up hunting and fishing. And that's why I pursued a, a, a career in resource management. And I think many on the call have probably heard of the Conservation Leaders for Tomorrow program. And man, uh, the importance of that, you know, society is changing and and I'm, we're just not seeing people come through with a strong interest in teaching people about hunting and fishing. And so um, to get a challenge, it's probably going to continue. Yeah. Well, it's interesting. My background's a little non-traditional when it comes to R3, right? You know, I came straight from education, conservation, certainly, and I was an adult onset hunter. And so it meant that my agency had to take a gamble on me and trust that I was going to lean in on this particular workforce. But I think part of it is we certainly re-examine how we uh, establish pipelines to diverse candidates with different backgrounds than traditionally we've reached out to as we face this evolving community that we serve and then we're pulling, you know, work candidates from and take a look at what the most important qualifying conditions are for, for bringing them in as employees because that's, that's changing certainly. So I think you're right, you know, we're, we're at an interesting and pivotal time in history. Uh, Bill, I wanted to circle back to you and see, you know, were there any challenges that you had in mind here that you'd like to share before we move on to the next part of the conversation? I was just thinking about what uh, John said about the challenge of, uh, you know, trying to put too many programs together and, you know, working every weekend and that kind of stuff. It's, you just got to kind of weave through it and, you know, learn to work by yourself, basically is what, you know, I mean, you're out there and you're trying to drive these programs to getting everything going. And I, I have that tendency to, you know, over schedule things and get, you know, 
try to do too many things, you know, to get get things rolling to keep keep the keep the balls going. And uh, then the other thing was when I first came on, it was you know challenging for me to get to know the people from the you know the DNR and different departments and whatever. And uh, Dennis and the other folks were great on you know helping me. Hey, you need to get a hold of this person to. If you're going to do this in the state parks, if you're going to do this in a state game area, here's the person's name. And so it's uh, it's been great to work with those folks, and they've helped lead me through and guide me to make things happen on the, on the state state game areas and state shooting ranges. So uh, it's, been, it's been great. But. Awesome. Well, thanks for sharing your perspective on that, Bill. And you know, one last piece I'd like to wrap up with all of us on here before we we say goodbye and and had our own ways is, is this final concept of what advice would you give folks that are that are kind of looking at doing this? We've already hit on some highlights, right? Like work with your procurement team, make sure you're working with your regional fed staff so you've got the right language in place to move forward. Um, make sure they're fully integrated with your team. Um, you could incorporate them into the development of systems and methodologies for implementing as opposed to implementing programs or be the owner of programs depending on the need within your organization. But what other what other pieces haven't we hit on yet that relate to the advice you'd give somebody looking at these kinds of positions? I can go first. Um, I would say you really want to, you know, when you're looking at these positions, you really want to get both the, the leaderships of both organizations to understand what you're trying to do. Um, if, you know, state agencies can have a tendency to, it's like, oh, this looks great. It's like the shiny bulb thing. You know, it's the bright light. It's like, we're going to go here, go here, go here. You really want to make sure that they understand that this is, even though we talk about a three-year grant, you're trying to build something that's going to last for a while, kind of like what Doug was talking about. And you have to get that commitment and understanding that this isn't just a one-shot effort. This is something that, you know, you're really trying to do to change what's going on in your state. And you need that partner. You need those partner organizations to really move it forward. You know, they have access to the chapter volunteers. They have the ability to do things outside of the agency rules and regulations and getting them to understand not only what you're trying to do, but the length that you're trying to, you know, establish these positions for, I think is very critical. And, you know, we were successful in doing that in Michigan. And here we are 10 years later, you know, working with great partners and really moving the ball. So that, but that getting that, you know, acceptance up front is really important from my perspective. I think that's crucial for all of our three, right? Getting that background and support from leadership so that you can move forward because that is part of the identity of your organization and that strong foundation that's pivotal. Uh, I think that's that's essential. So I appreciate you sharing that in regard to these positions. It's absolutely part of what makes these sustainable. Uh, thank you for sharing that. In reading, Doug, in reading Doug's comment there, I would absolutely agree. I think this partnership, even though it took some time in Nebraska, it really has strengthened the relationship between the state chapter and local chapters of the NBTF with the Nebraska Game and Parks Commission. I think it's has and is continuing to open up new partnership opportunities even outside of the realm of R3 um, and just getting that, you know, getting those folks excited and more supportive of the state agency because they're seeing kind of what a partnership position can do, what that pipeline looks like, um, and like that line of communication that a position like this provides. Excellent. Uh, Doug, you've got a lot to say in the chat instead of out loud. Go for it. Well, I just I want to make sure I give everybody a chance to speak. So I, I was just echoing what Hunter said is over the last three years, we have seen our chapters are like, yeah, we they're more event driven, you know, before they were uh, fundraising and habitat driven, but they weren't doing a lot of events because they weren't sure of the values and having our three coordinators presenting this data go, hey, here's our license trends or, you know, here's what we're seeing in this age group or, or whatever the effort is within your state. Um, and it might not be event, it might be something else, but those volunteer forces are activated because they're getting the communication and the information and, and, and that engagement that 
that's what they're there for. That's why they have established themselves. They want to do their stuff in their community. And um, yeah, I think that's been instrumental. It's good to hear that it's working in Nebraska as well. And I think that the, the, I, I typed in a text, I said, this is not a criticism. The RD doesn't have the capacity, to have those deep relationships within your community, right? They support banquets, they support the, the, the organizational structure, but they're representing four or five states, right? So this just, again, I said this position gives capacity at the state level to do something that wasn't established that someone wasn't already doing. And it also, I think it does it at the organizational level of the, the Turkey Federation or PF that, you know, wow, here's our R3 voice. You can go to this person, get great information and, you know, start assigning values to what R3 is and how that benefits a, a, a chapter or something like that. So um, it's, it's a win-win, you know, if you can get through the hurdles that Dennis and I described about, you know, the machine, the mechanism to, to, to get everybody on board. But once you do, um, I found nothing but value from, from this type of relationship. Fantastic. Any other advice you'd like to offer before we sign off today? You know, the, the only other thing that I, that comes to mind for me is that um, maybe the next frontier of our degree where we've maybe been a little slower as the DEI front, diversity, equity, and inclusion. And I mean, if, if we feel that there's value uh, in, in our three coordinators, you know, maybe there's value in our three coordinators that, that target previously untargeted populations to, you know, devoted coordinators to that. So I just sort of put that out there as a challenge. Um, we, I think in Wisconsin, we've really done well you know, hitting millennial and women audiences, and we're reaching out to diverse audiences, but I think that there's a lot more to be done there. And uh, I think that there there could be value in considering our three coordinators just to target um, non-traditional populations. John, I, you said something as a caveat that I want to highlight and underline and put a star next to, and, and it, you know, certainly not if there is value in reaching diverse audiences, but that there is value in reaching diverse audiences and to expand your capacity as a team to do so is an essential component of the staff that we hire and the partnerships that we have. And so I, I thank you for highlighting that. And I completely agree that the cornerstone of R3 is continuing to reach the people that don't look and act like us, right? And taking them out into the field and exposing them and engaging them or increasing awareness that they already exist, right? That's the work that we have on our plate. So thank you for bringing that up. DEI certainly is a part of, of, of these partnerships. Thank you. What other thoughts do you have out there about advice that we can offer these teams? All right, looks like we've tapped out. All the expertise has been recorded. We got it all. Well, thank you all so much for joining me today. I feel like this was an excellent conversation about the, the expansion in our toolkits that these shared NGO state positions can offer. And that's really what we're talking about with this series. It's, it's expanding our toolkits, it's breaking down silos to work together as a collective conservation community to get this work done. Um, and you all are, are knocking it out of this ballpark. I'm so thankful you were willing to join us today. Um, so for all of you at home, thank you so much for watching this episode. I hope you learned something. Please come back in two weeks when we launch our next episode. And if you have any suggestions or ideas for future episodes, please feel free to contact me directly at Tanaya at cast.org.